congregation cried out loudly, Amen. <laughs> Friends, I'd like to uh, read to you from the Gospel of John. Now, this is chapter 11, verses 38, excuse me, 38 through 44. It's a story that uh, perhaps you're familiar with, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Listen to this, the word of God. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, Come on. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm one of those persons who both likes and dislikes scary movies. Picture this with me. It's late at night. The house lights are all turned off. There's only the soft blue glow of the television casting more shadows than lighting up dark corners. There's slow, methodical, minor key music playing in the background as figures lurch and slobber across the screen, each zombie seeking out innocent lives to fill their unnatural desires. Soon a scream can be heard, piercing and echoing, echoing both high and then low with no breath being drawn in between. I begin to look around the room. Shivers running down my back. Where is that screaming coming from? No one on the TV seems to be doing it. But wait, it's me. Scary movies get to me sometimes. They build upon our natural sense of self-preservation by casting certain images, playing certain music, creating suspense and a sense of danger until we are scared. Some of us like to be scared. It's an experience like no other. And I wonder if in some small way that was the feeling just before Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus of Bethany, brother to Mary and Martha, whom we hear about throughout the Gospels, is a friend of Jesus. In fact, a dear friend, one whom he loves. Lazarus grows sick, and the sisters send word to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now you and I might respond immediately, right? One whom we love is sick, sick enough to be dying. And this means we wrap things up at work, and we get someone to watch the dog and to check our mailbox, and we leave to be with our loved one. Things might be a little bit different today. We've got Zoom and Face Messaging and FaceTime and all of that, and so we would get a better feel for exactly what's happening. But still, we would go to be with our loved one. And Jesus takes a different approach altogether. He waits a couple of additional days before going to Judea. 
adversity seems to minimize Lazarus' condition by saying that Lazarus had fallen asleep. And the disciples say to themselves, well, then it can't be all that bad. He's just sleeping. They had misunderstood what Jesus meant. So he set them straight. Lazarus has died. He was dead. No life in him. And this is where I think Mary and Martha were feeling a bit frightened or, or scared. Their brother was gone. They had believed not only that Jesus could heal their brother, but that he would heal their brother. Why didn't he come? The brother was dead. Now, sure, it would be nice to still see Jesus, old, old friends and all that, but there just wasn't any saving of Lazarus anymore. He's gone. And so Jesus arrives in Bethany. And when you read chapter 11 with its mention of Bethany and Jerusalem and Judea, Jesus leaving and arriving and Mary and Martha over here, it, it can be a bit confusing. Here's how we can make sense of it. Think of Judea, like Manitowoc County. And Jerusalem would be the city of Manitowoc. And then only several miles away would be Spring Valley, like the village of Bethany. Well, by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead and in the tomb for four days. And we know what happens to a body that's been dead for four days, right? We've seen decaying bodies of squirrels and rabbits and deer and cows. There's an odor that's unmistakable. Decay sets in. Features are no longer firm and set. And most of us, uh, probably all of us, want nothing to do with a body that's been dead for four days. And I'm talking about bodies that uh, have not been embalmed or filled with preservatives. So it's no wonder that Martha said to Jesus, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Not sleeping, not ill, but dead and buried. And there's a time in our calendar year where, where we think about such things the dead, those who have passed on before us, the lives of our loved ones, and the promise that Jesus makes to each one of us through his own resurrection. And John, he foreshadows his resurrection by the raising of Lazarus. I'm thinking, of course, of Halloween, which is celebrated on October 31st each year. Incidentally, also the birthday of my older brother. Uh, more of a trick than a treat, really. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I love that. The tradition of celebration, this celebration of Halloween originated with the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain when people would light bonfires, wear costumes to ward off ghosts and to trick evil spirits. And in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III designated November 1st as a time to honor all saints. It was called All Saints Day, which would in time replace the traditions of Samhain. The evening before it was known as All Hallows Eve and later on Halloween. And in time, Halloween evolved into a day of activities, a day of community, a day of gathering together, trick-or-treating and carving jack-o'-lanterns, celebratory gatherings or parties, if you will, costumes and eating of treats. By the year 1000, the church made November 2nd All Souls Day, a day in which we honor the dead. Now, what's the difference between All Saints Day and All Souls Day? Well, All Saints Day, we celebrate the Christian saints who have gone on before us. And All Souls Day, we celebrate all of those who have gone on before us. 
regardless of their, their place in Christianity. So here Jesus is. He's standing before the tomb, the cave really, with the stone lying against the entrance. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Roll it away. Move that stone. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus prayed. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I knew you always hear me. But now the people standing here also know you always hear me. Now they may believe that you sent me. And this is an important part, not only of the story of the raising of Lazarus, but an important part of our Gospels. Jesus prays. He, he prays to God the Father, and he wants his disciples to know this. And, and they do, of course. They eventually ask him to teach them how to pray like he prays. But he also wants the other people standing around to know that he prays. He prays with the disciples. He goes to lonely places to pray. He prays in the Olive Garden. He prays on the night of his arrest. He prays early in the morning while it's still dark. He prays for Simon Peter. He prays on the night of his arrest. He prays from the cross. Get where I'm going with this? He prays often. And in every situation. Not just when he wants something, not just not when he's in a dark place. He prays a lot, often and a lot. <laughs> and we should too. Not only does he tell us to pray, but he shows us that he prays. And after his prayer at the tomb, he shouts, Lazarus, come out. There's a story that Jesus had to specify Lazarus. If he had just called out or cried out, come out, then all the dead would have risen. By the power of his voice alone. And so he comes out wrapped in linen cloth, hand and feet bound, face covered, pungent as all get out. And the miracle we witness. This miracle over death, a miracle by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, really isn't all about Lazarus. In fact, Lazarus' name only comes up a couple more times. Now think about this. Lazarus was dead for four days. Don't you kind of wonder what he experienced? Don't you kind of ask yourself, well, what was that like? Was it like falling asleep and then waking up? Was it more? I want to hear more about Lazarus. But he's only mentioned a couple of times, both in reference to people coming to believe in Jesus. It's not all about Lazarus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is saying, I have the power to raise you from the dead. You need not fear death, because I can, I will, I have conquered death. I am more than death will ever be. You will be raised by my command. You will know life everlasting with me. I will save you. All you need to do is listen to me and to believe in me. And I think that's something we can all do, right? We can listen, and we can believe, and we need not fear. There's nothing scary about Jesus. There's nothing scary about our earthly death. That's merely our next step to a new life with Him. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.